Uprising, chapter 29, Yetta, chapter 29, Yetta, page 269. Yetta was listening for the bell on the time clock, waiting for her day to finish. It was a Saturday afternoon in March, and the spring breezes were back. She heard them rattling the windows when the machines were shut down for lunch. She knew that as soon as she stepped outside, they'd tease at her hair and tug at her hat. This year, the breezes seemed to carry a slightly different message. Another year passed, and what have you done? What have you, sh- what have you to show for yourself? So you can read English a little bit better. So you handed out a few suffrage flyers. Do you think that's enough? What would ever be enough for Yetta? I don't think they set the clocks back again, the girl beside her muttered. I've got, it's got to be past, I think they set the clocks back again, the girl beside her muttered. It's got to be past quitting time. And that's why we need a strong union, why we need a closed shop, Yetta muttered back. The girl rolled her eyes at Yetta. Don't you ever give up, she asked over the clatter of the machine. No, Yetta said, but she grinned at the girl and the girl grinned back. And Yetta thought maybe, just maybe, they inched just a little closer to solidarity, Yetta, to the solidarity Yetta longed for. The girl's name was Jenny and she was new. The bell finally rang, and Yetta and Jenny both stood up and stretched, reviving cramped muscles, unhunched, unhunching round shoulders, stamping feet that had gone numb on the sewing machine pedal. I'm going dancing tonight, Jenny said, mischievously tapping out the rhythm on the floor. What are you doing? Um, I don't know, Yetta said. I haven't decided yet. Belle and Jane had been nagging her to go visit Rahel and, new baby, and the new baby, a little boy they named Benjamin. Bella and Jane had already gone once, but Yetta had a cold then and only sent her regrets. Well, really, I wouldn't want the, the baby getting sick because of me, Yetta told herself. Maybe I'm not well enough even yet. I bet that cutters who watches you that cutter who watches you all the time will take you dancing, Jenny said. All you have to do is just she pantomimed cozying up to an invisible man, gazing up adoringly at an invisible man's face fluttering her eyelashes, yet a blushed. There's not a cutter who watches me all the time, she said, but she couldn't help glancing toward Jacob's table. Jacob hadn't said a word to her about dancing since she turned down his invitation all those months ago, but he did seem to find a lot of reason to walk past the sewing machine to ride in the same elevator with her every morning and evening. Even halfway across the room, she could instantly pick out this figure in the cluster, his figure in the cluster of cutters, standing around laughing and talking and snu- and smoking. Jacob has was bent over the table, smoothing out layers of lawn fabric, ready to be cut first thing mor- Monday morning. There had been at least 120 layers of gauzy fabric spread across the table, each one separated from others by sheer tissue paper. Jacob handled it all so gently, almost lovingly. Above his head, the tissue paper patterns dangled from wires, so when he stood up, it was like watching someone across the forest, half hidden by hanging moss and low branches. Suddenly, Jacob and the other cutters jumped back. One of the men sprinted over to a shelf on the wall and seized a red pail of red fire pail. Jerkily, he raced back and threw the pail under the pail of water under one of the tables at the huge bin of fabric scraps left over from days and days and days of cutting shirt waists. Not again, those cutters and their cigars, Yetta said scornfully. It was clear what had happened. One of them had dropped a match or a cigarette butt or a still burning ember into a scrap bin, or at least someone was smart enough to keep buckets of water around if the cutters couldn't be stopped from smoking. But then there was a flash, and Yetta saw a flame jump up from under the table to the top of it. More men grabbed buckets, desperately pouring water onto the flames. But there had only been three buckets on that shelf, so they had to run across the room for more. The water was nothing to the fire. The flames raced the length of the lawn fabric. They sprang up to the dangling paper patterns and danced from one to the next. The patterns riding down to ash and spinning off more flames. In seconds, the fire had gone from being something to scoff at under the table to a ferocious beast ready to engulf the entire room. Beside Yetta, Jenny began to scream. Stop it! This building is fireproof! Yetta yelled at Jenny. But we're tender, she remembered. 
Yetta slams her hands against Jenny's shoulders and screams, Go! The aisle between the sewing machine tables was narrow, and the wicker baskets where they stacked the shirtwaist kept snap the shirt stack the shirt waist kept snagging their skirts and the other girls were blocking the aisles once some screaming hysterically like Jenny had been one girl fainted right at Yetta's feet Yetta reached down and slapped her jerked her up no time for that Yetta screamed you'll die across the room Yetta saw a spark lamp in a woman's hair in seconds the woman's whole pompadour was aflame everyone was screaming but Yetta thought she could hear the woman scream above all the others the woman lurched across the room, slammed into one of the windows. No, slammed through. She'd thrown herself out of the window. We're on the eighth floor, Yetta thought numbly. And now it was her turn to freeze in panic and fear. Sparks were flying throughout the room now, landing everywhere. Anyone could be next. Hands grabbed Yetta from behind. Yetta, come on! It was Jacob. Jacob and Yetta shoved forward toward the Washington Place stairs, pulling along Jenny and the girl who fainted. Yetta glanced back once more as she, <clears throat> and was relieved to see that Mr. Bernstein, the factory manager, had had some of the men pull out a fire hose out of, green, out of the Green Street stairwell. He stood over the worst of the flames, pointing the hose confidently. No water came out. Turn it on! Turn it on! Mr. Bernstein was screaming. Yetta wasn't so sure if she could hear him or if she was just reading his lips. Where's the water? He's, Where's the water? He screamed again. Not a drop. He flung the holes down and ran. Now Mr. Bernstein was rushing through the crowds of girls, still heading toward the cloakroom to get their hats. Don't worry about your hats, he screamed. Just get out. He was slapping and punching the girls, beating them as though he blamed them for the fire. No, he was goading them towards the doors, towards the elevators and the fire escape. He was only slapping the hysterical girls like Yetta had done with the girl who fainted. He was trying to save their lives. We're on the same side now, Mr. Bernstein and me, Yetta marveled. She shoved against the girl who dropped her purse, who'd seen her coins roll under the table. Don't stop for that, Yetta screamed. It's not worth it. Save your life. She and Jacob pulled up the girl, lifting her past the table toward the door. There were already dozens of other girls around the door, screaming in Yiddish and English, and what Yetta now recognized as Italian. Open it! Open it! Oh, please, for the love of God! Madonna mia! Madonna mia! But it was locked. Some of the girls were pounding on the elevator door, too, screaming for the elevator to open, elevator operator to come to them. Miraculously, the elevator door opened, and the crowd surged forward, sobbing and praying and screaming, Just wait! Just wait! I'll come right back! The operator hollered. The operator hollered. The doors were closing, but Yetta shoved Jenny forward, shoving her on top of the girls already in the elevator, saving her, at least. Will he come back? Yetta asked Jacob, and Jacob shrugged. Yetta couldn't stand there and wait. She wasn't going to stand still while flames raced toward her, while others pressed their faces against the door that might never open. She grabbed Jacob's hand, pulled him along, circling around the fire. She looked back once and saw that someone had managed to open the door to Washington Place stairs. The door opened in toward the crowd. Maybe it hadn't been locked after all. Maybe it was just the weight of the crowd pushing forward, pinning it shut. But it was too late to go back now. Flames were shooting across the path they'd just crossed, speeding across the oiled floor, licking up shirtwaists and fabric scraps and wicker baskets. The air itself seemed to be on fire. The flames living on fabric dust. Fire escape. Yetta moaned to Jacob, and it was so hot now that the words felt like flames themselves, painful on her tongue. No good, Jacob mumbled back. Doesn't go all the way to the ground. So they didn't head for the window near the air shaft, where people were climbing out one at a time onto the rickety metal railing. What was left? Green, she Green Street stairs, Jacob whispered. Those were back by the tables where the fire had started, where it now burned the fire crest. But there was a partition wall blocking off the stairs and the elevator from the rest of the room. On a normal work day, that was where the guard sat inspecting purses and glaring at the girls if he thought they were all thieves. As if he thought they were all thieves. Today, maybe that partition was enough to keep the fire away from the stairs. 
Yetta and Jacob raced on, skirting the flames, still pulling along hysterical, senseless workers who didn't seem to know where to go. They passed the desk where, they, where the bookkeeper, Mrs. Lipshook, was shouting into her mouthpiece of the telephone, Please, somebody listen. Please, somebody tell. Somebody's got to tell the ninth floor. Hello, somebody, please. A spark landed on the sleeve of Yetta's shirtwaist, and she watched in horror as it sputtered and shimmered and burned straight through. She could feel, feel it singeing her skin. Jacob slapped his bare hand onto Yetta's sleeve, starving the flame. A dank, Yetta whispered, but there was no time for him to say, You're welcome. Because they were, because they were where the doorway to the partition now shoving their way behind it. No flames here. Girls were still standing by the freight elevator door, the only elevator they were normally allowed to use. They were pounding on the closed door like they thought it was their only chance. It was so hot behind that partition that Yetta could barely breathe. Can people melt? She wondered. In her mind, she saw wax dripping down from Sabbath, camp, Sabbath candles. My life melting away. Stairs, Jacob screamed at the girls by the elevator. He jerked open the stairway door and it opened out, making another obstacle in the tiny vestibule. Yetta and Jacob shoved the girls through the doorway and scrambled in behind them. The stairways was airless and closed, was airless and close and still hot, but there were no sparks flying through the air, through the window in the stairwell. Yetta could see the workers scrambling down the fire escape teetering precariously on the metal railing, struggling past the metal shutters. Hurry! Yetta screamed at the girls around her. They were sobbing hysterically, clutching the railing, clutching each other. They were yammering away in some language Yetta didn't understand or recognize, or maybe it wasn't a language at all, just witless jabbering. The fire, one of them managed to say. What if it's everywhere? There's no smoke coming from down there, Yetta screamed at them pointing to the landings below them. Go down to the ground. You'll be safe. The flames are going up, not down, up. Yetta glanced up to the landing above her, remembering what the bookkeeper said and had been screaming into the phone. Somebody listened. Somebody's got to tell the ninth floor. They didn't know one flight up on the ninth floor. There were 250 girls work, where 250 girls worked, where Yetta had worked before the strike. Rebella worked now, up there. They had no idea there was an inferno raging beneath them, eating up the air, climbing higher and higher and higher, almost on their own. Yet his feet had already started slapping down the stairs once she finally got the jabbering girls to moving on. But now she stopped. Bella, she thought, my other friends, my sisters, my camarades, my union. What are you doing, Jacob screamed, already three steps down. Somebody has to tell the ninth floor, she screamed. She screamed back, I have to. She turned around and began clattering up the stairs. That's the end of chapter 29.